The Community Foundation supports local nonprofits with a new program, how organizations will have more services available. The Muncie Street Department plans to handle potholes this spring, how they're using public insight to help. Day two of a historic confirmation hearing begins, how Supreme Court nominee Katanji Jackson could make history. Pfizer partners up to help fight COVID around the world, how they are providing over 90 countries with medicine. And I've got a severe weather threat as well as rain continuing throughout the week in my full forecast. Delaware County's only live television newscast from Ball State University's Unified Media Newsroom. You're watching NewsLink Indiana. For being with us, I'm Katherine Segal. And I'm Avery Johnson. Nonprofit organizations in Delaware County will soon be getting more support from the Community Foundation with a new program. NewsLink Indiana's Anna Chalker is live at the Community Foundation of Muncie in Delaware County, where the program was created. Anna? Yeah, guys, I am outside of the Community Foundation building where Nonprofit Support Network was created and will be assisting organizations in Delaware County. And according to a press release sent to NewsLink Indiana today, all nonprofit organizations across Delaware County will be able to receive a variety of services through the network. A steering committee of five partners in Delaware County will be working alongside the foundation to give guidance to nonprofit organizations on how to grow their services. Nonprofit Support Network will be providing training, help create collaborations, relationship development, and ways for the organization to analyze what skills are lacking and providing where they can get that support. Now, after talking to President Kelly Schrock, she said that their mission for the support network is, quote, we hope to see healthy, well-supported, sustainable nonprofits in Delaware County. And for the community members who want to be involved, Schrock says to show awareness and support, learn what services are available in different locations, and step out to see where you can contribute. Please, it's not just you and I link arms and we walk in the same direction. <laughs> that may be partnership, and that's a good first step, but true collaboration is what can we do together that, that draws on our strengths as organizations. Now, nonprofit organizations can expect additional information about the nonprofit support network and how to engage with its services after May 1st. Live in Muncie, Anna Chalker, NewsLink, Indiana. Thank you so much, Anna. A food bank continuing to help out the community. NewsLink Indiana's Rebecca Rosado went to today's Second Harvest Food Bank to see how they're lending a hand. Second Harvest Food Bank has been serving Central Indiana since 1983, and here in Muncie, the organization helps provide different services to all areas of the community. Harvest is an organization that works on food security here, not only in our community, but and also in surrounding community. Susan Dillon is a local community member that has been helping Second Harvest's drive through bank for a while. We've been doing this particular food distribution now for over a year through the pandemic, we do it weekly. It's in collaboration with the Common Way Church, and they've had volunteers to come out here and to do that each week. This particular food bank helps the Old West End neighborhood obtain food options that help make up a well-rounded diet. We usually get three items, usually some kind of a fruit or vegetable, and it's not intended to be the primary substance of food for the uh, people for the week, but also it's supposed to complement with something that's healthy that will help them uh, have something that maybe they normally wouldn't be able to get. And community members are thankful to get the extra assistance. It means a lot, you know, it helps out with the extra food, the, or the fruit and vegetables and something, something you can't really afford, you know. Now, the bank does more than just provide food. Dylan says these food banks help build connections. It's not just about food, it's about relationships, it's about making friendships, it's about um, for example, somebody this morning asked for prayer, and we were able to pray with them. In Muncie, Rebecca Rosado, NewsLink, Indiana. For more information and to find upcoming food banks, go to curehunger.org. Winter is officially over, and the salt on the Muncie roads should be gone, but that often leaves the streets with one thing, potholes. But the Muncie Street Department tells NewsLink, Indiana, it has a plan to tackle Muncie potholes this spring. City Engineer and Street Superintendent Adam Leach says winter weather is to thank you for resurfacing potholes and the reason it's hard to keep up with them in the winter. During the colder months, the city has to use what's called cold mix, which Leach says it's often a temporary fix. 
The good news though, now that we're through the thick of Indiana winter weather, hot mix aggregate is now out on the streets and headed to the major potholes in Muncie. The, uh, the guys have done, been doing a pretty good job just in the one week we've had a hot mix on catching up on some of the more major potholes around town. Hopefully everybody's kind of seen a little improvement there, but I understand the dodging them the Indiana way. For now, the city of Muncie encourages residents to report potholes to the Muncie Street Reporting Hub, where you can even vote for which potholes you'd like to see fixed first. You can find that by searching Muncie Street Reporting Hub. And I've been on the roads a lot with this warm weather. I had my windows down, I was driving around, but now with that rain, I cannot be doing that. I know, I'm <laughs> definitely not looking forward to the rain, and after today, I've already had enough of it. Oliver, what's the weather looking like for this week? Well, then you guys probably aren't going to like the rest of the week. We are going to be seeing those showers continue throughout until Friday. But right now we are sitting at 52 degrees here in Muncie, 51 degrees in Indianapolis and almost 70 degrees in Cincinnati. But like I was saying earlier, those showers might turn into severe weather threats. We are in a slight threat area here in Muncie and Northern Ohio, but I will be talking about that in my larger forecast as well as the rain continuing throughout the week and a milder week on the way next week. Thank you, Oliver. The Biden administration is providing more than $1.7 billion in funding to help Louisiana bounce back from deadly hurricanes. Parts of the Bayou State were devastated by Hurricanes Laura and Delta in 2020, followed by Hurricane Ida in 2021. More than 8,000 Louisiana households are still living in temporary shelters like trailers and manufactured housing. Another 1,400 are being forced to live in hotels because of the storms, according to FEMA. Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards says he is grateful to the money from HUD and the Biden administration to help expedite the recovery. Republican Congressman Garrett Graves also welcomes the news, but complains the funds should have been made available six months ago. Day two of historic confirmation hearings began earlier today. President Joe Biden's Supreme Court nominee, Katanji Brown Jackson, would be the first black woman to serve as a Supreme Court justice. So far, Democrats have used the hearings to praise her as an exceptionally qualified trailblazing nominee whose time spent as a federal public defender would add a unique perspective to the bench. Republicans, on the other hand, have focused on her judicial philosophy. They brought up concerns about her stance on crime, warning against activism, and race questions about her view of the Constitution. Day three of hearings will continue tomorrow. And Pfizer is partnering up with UNICEF to release a new pill. Find out who the pill is for. Plus, a new study reveals why quitting smoking has become harder in recent years. All that and more after the break. Riding the bus is an easy thing to do. Last year, we carried 60,000 riders from the Ball State area. 50,000 of those were students. Anywhere you want to go, MITS will take you there. So I just moved in with his family and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that. That's disgusting. Oh, poop already. You're making me nervous. Oh, okay. I can't look at this anymore.
I really hope he grows out of this for his sake. Welcome back. Pfizer and UNICEF are partnering up to fight COVID-19 around the world. Starting next month, Pfizer will supply 4 million courses of Paxlovid, its COVID-19 antiviral pill, to UNICEF. The medicine will go to people in 95 low- and middle-income countries, which covers 53% of the world's population. And lower-income countries will just pay a not-for-profit price, and countries with higher incomes will pay according to a tiered pricing arrangement. The announcement comes days after a statement by the medicine's patent pool that 35 companies will begin producing inexpensive generic versions of Paxlovid to increase access to treatment. The White House is in need of more money to fight COVID-19. Without Congress approving additional funding, the administration can't afford COVID-19 testing, treatment, and vaccines. An administration official says the government has enough to vaccinate children under five years old and offer a fourth booster to the amino immunocompromised. But any other measures is out of the budget right now. The funding comes from the $1.9 trillion from the American Rescue Plan, but most of that has already been allocated to cities, states, and other agencies. So far, lawmakers have not been able to agree on additional funding measures. We're learning more about how COVID-19 affects pregnant women. Getting the virus when a woman is pregnant raises the risk of several kinds of complications. That's the latest from a new study published yesterday by the journal JAMA International Medicine. Women who got COVID were more likely to have severe health issues like breathing problems, sepsis, blood clots, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. They also had more than double the risk of giving birth too early. Scientists are still looking into the effects on babies, so they're recommending doctors to keep, an eye, to keep a close eye on babies whose mothers got COVID. If you take blood pressure medication, listen up. Pfizer is voluntarily recalling its blood pressure drug, Acuretic, because there's too much of a particular impurity called nitrosamines. They're common in water, in water and food like cured and grilled meats, dairy, and vegetables, but they could increase the risk of cancer if you're exposed too much for too long. There haven't been any reports on anything happening to people who've, gotten who've taken medication, but Pfizer is recalling it just in case. That includes the brand name and two generics. You can find more details on the Pfizer's website. A research letter from the published medical journal JAMA today revealed it was more difficult for teens to quit smoking in 2020. The study found more teens unsuccessfully tried to quit smoking that year than in each of the previous 13 years. Researchers looked at surveys of more than 815,000 teens. Questions about cigarettes were asked every year, but questions about e-cigarettes were added in 2020. The study found in 2020, nearly 6% of adolescents reported an unsuccessful attempt at quitting either cigarettes or e-cigarettes. The authors said the contribution of e-cigarettes to unsuccessful quitting attempts by adolescents is substantial and warrants consideration as the U.S. develops policies to regulate e-cigarettes. And nearly out of one out of every three workers in the U.S. makes less than $15 per hour, according to Oxfam America. The anti-poverty advocacy group says these employees' annual salary is under $32,000. Researchers also say 47% of black workers are below the $15 threshold, which is almost twice the number of white counterparts. A similar split was also among female employees, who are more likely to make less than males. This report is among the movements to get the federal minimum wage raised from its current level of $7.25, where it's been since 2009. And meanwhile, in Florida, Disney employees used their breaks to protest a Florida bill and the company's response to it. They staged walkouts today at various locations all over Florida's parental rights and education bill. Florida's Senate passed the bill earlier this month, and Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to sign it into law. Disney opposes it, saying on Instagram it opposes any legislation that infringes on basic human rights. It would ban classroom instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity before fourth grade. Disney also said it stands in solidarity and supports with their LGBTQIA cast, crew, guests, and fans. Now talking about that rainy weather earlier, Oliver is going to have a quick look to see if that continues. Oliver? Yeah, that rainy weather should continue into the next week, but I'll have all that and more in my full forecast.
you go. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's just vapor with flavor. It won't hurt my kid like cigarettes, right? Vaping is safer than smoking, isn't it? There's really not even that much nicotine in them, right? My kid? My kid, my kid knows it's dangerous. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping, maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. Emotes say a lot, but they can't say it all. Think your guildmate is struggling? Try these dialogue options. Go beyond emotes. Check in with your guildmates at seizetheawkward.org. Every day. Millions of people are connecting. And even though we're overcoming obstacles, watching each other's backs, and banding together, we should still make an effort. We should still make an effort to get to know each other on a deeper level. Father. Cosplayer. Mentor. Actor. It's time we take a step forward. It's time we take a step forward. Come together and discover how accepting our differences can, can make, make us stronger. Welcome back. It's currently 9.16 and today has been a gloomy and wet day. Oliver, what are we going to expect? Well, we should be expecting rain to be sticking around the entire rest of the week. But right now we are sitting at 52 degrees in Muncie, 51 degrees in Indianapolis, and generally the lower 50s all across Indiana. Now looking at the current radar, those showers that have been plaguing the area are going to be sticking around later into tonight and most of that is due to this larger weather system that is currently making its way through northern Alabama, Tennessee and Kentucky and by tomorrow it will be hitting our area which means we do have a severe weather threat in place. We here in Muncie are at about a level two of five for the weather, but the rest of Indiana is about at a level one of five, and that two of five uh, slight severe threat does extend into northern Ohio. Now, what should we be expecting from the severe weather? Well, the chance of a tornado is slim to none, but we still are going to put that up there. But we are more worried about the damaging winds as well as hail and uh, heavy rainfall that would be coming with these pockets of storms that will be coming through the area on Wednesday. Now looking at the precision cast for wind, those should be hitting our area again. Tonight we will be seeing some storms pass through the area and as we go into Wednesday morning we'll be, we will be seeing these pop-up storms happening all across the area. And, but we do see a little bit of clear sections but that clear sections only means that the more intense storms are going to possibly lead to severe weather. As we can see here, Wednesday at 4, we are going to be seeing the biggest pockets of severe weather that are going to be coming through the area. Now that's likely to develop into something a little bit more severe, but we will keep tracking that as the day goes on on Wednesday. But as we move into Thursday, if temperatures drop enough, we might be seeing some snow come into the area, mainly affecting Indianapolis, but it is possible that will move into the viewing area as we go into Friday and beyond into the weekend. Now looking at tonight, we are going to have a low of 54 degrees, scattered showers across the area. Like I said, winds coming from the east southeast at 15 to 20 miles per hour. And tomorrow we are going to be seeing those severe thunderstorms come into the area starting around noon, a gradual increase in temperature and then a little bit of a decrease as we go into the later afternoon. The wind sticking around the south at about 10 to 15 to 15 to 20 miles per hour. Now looking at our seven day forecast, of course those temperatures are going to drop once all that rain moves through. Saturday we are going to be a little bit windy and we are going to be seeing the biggest decrease in temperatures on the week ahead. Well, yeah, I'm definitely not looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I'm not excited for that storm. Definitely going to be staying inside. <laughs> Thank you, Oliver. 
Now over to Daniel with sports. We talked to one Ball State team about their consistent battles on the road this season, plus a Ball State athlete heading through regionals after a spectacular season. Find out who next in sports. Here's your sandwich, Miss. Oh, thank you. And your burger. Awesome, thank you. And your bowl of boiling water, sir. After retiring from the NFL, I've been able to spend a lot more time coaching my daughter's basketball teams. It's something I love to do. Through our games and our tournaments, we see all types of coaching, good and bad. And it begs the question, do we really know who's coaching our kids? Do they have the proper training and screening it would take for me to be comfortable with my daughters playing for that coach? Our Youth Basketball Association made the decision to use trusted coaches to screen and train all of our coaches. I'm a trusted coach. Are you? So if one cat has four kittens who reproduce every six months, how many cats will there be in five years? <coughs> Who's got it? Is this, what is that? <coughs> Seriously. Who threw that? Cats are terrible at math, but they sure do multiply. Please spay, neuter, and adopt. The solution is 10. Welcome back to NewsLink Indiana. I'm Daniel Keen with sports. Ball State softball has not played at home yet this season. NewsLink Indiana's Vinny Moderano took to the field to talk about the toll it takes on the Cardinals. Playing on the road is tough for any team in any sport. Now imagine playing your first 23 games on the road. Ball State softball is dealt with not playing in front of a home crowd since May 4th of last year. It's definitely practice for postseason, um, you know, especially this year being in some pretty hostile environments uh, on the road just prepares you for what you're going to see, um, you know, in postseason and, and being up against it uh, in some other teams' environments. But yeah, it's just being in the Midwest. That's the nature of the beast. You got to travel south. After years of dealing with an unforgiving schedule, the coaching staff has gotten it down to a science on how they go about finding a rhythm on the road. Sure, you kind of look at the season in two, two different parts, right? You've got your pre-conference schedule and then you've got conference and, you know, that's, there is not a lot of rhythm uh, pre-conference. You know, you're moving people around, finding the best fit for everybody um, and who's going to hit in the, in the certain spots that you're looking for and who works well next to each other on the field. As hard as it is being on other schools' diamonds all the time, it's even more difficult being out of the classroom for those extended periods, but the support the players have around them makes it all possible. It isn't easy, but it's very manageable. We have a lot of support and we have each other. We have our coaches, we have advisors um, and professors as well. They, they make it possible for us. With the challenges the Cardinals face on a day-to-day -day basis, the feeling of putting everything together means that much more. <laughs> Uh, well, I feel like we've been pretty close all year long. You know, it was just a matter of putting all of the puzzle pieces together. So I think the sense of relief like that we finally, you know, put the puzzle together and it was just a matter of, you know, finishing it off. Ball State softball will play their first home game at First Merchants Ballpark on April 1st when the Kent State Golden Flash has come to town. In Muncie, Vinny Motorano, NewsLink, Indiana. Tossing things over to the gym, Ball State gymnast Suki Fister being selected for the NCAA Norman Regional today. Fister's fantastic season thus far being extended after learning she qualified for regionals. 
Pfister's season accolades include being named to the 2022 Mid-American Conference Specialist of the Year, ranking top 30 in the nation with an NQS score of 9.895, as well as earning silver in the MAC championships this past Saturday with a, uh, with a score of 9.850. Pfister also being named to the All-MAC First Team, earning two MAC Specialist of the Week honors and becoming only the fifth gymnast in program history to earn a score of 9.950 or higher in any event. Fister is set to compete at 2 p.m. Eastern at the Lloyd Noble Center in Norman, Oklahoma, and if she places first, could move on to the NCAA Women's National Championships in Fort Worth, Texas. Now guys, let's go back to softball really quick. I cannot imagine not being able to play my own home games. Yeah, I, I mean, I that. came from a school of 5,000 people, so I know how important that fan base is. Oh, I think it's a huge part in a team success. So thank you so much, Daniel. I appreciate that. And after the break, we'll show you our anchor picks. Plus, we have one final look at weather. Stay with us. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Just like the rules to surviving Zombieland, there are steps you can take to be prepared for an emergency. It's the right thing to do. Talk with your family to make a plan. Look for safe areas to meet up if separated. And stock up on supplies. It's never too early to get prepared. So start now. Right now? Right now. You can't predict emergencies, but you can be ready. You're welcome, America. Visit ready.gov today to learn more. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back. Kylie Jenner is making an adjustment to her newborn's birth certificate. The 24-year-old cosmetic influencer said on Instagram that her son, born last month, will no longer be called Wolf. According to her post, Jenner said she and her partner, Travis Scott, determined that name didn't fit. The mother of two didn't say what the replacement name will be or if one has been chosen yet. This announcement came hours after Jenner released a YouTube video in honor of the baby, which was titled To Our Son. And moving on, Amanda Bynes' conservatorship ended today. The protective measure was taken in 2013 after the 35-year-old the actress allegedly started a small fire at a home in Thousand Oaks. Bynes filed the request to have her mother's conservatorship ended last month. Bynes' parents are reportedly supportive of the move, and today Judge Roger Lund officially ended the legal supervision of her professional and personal affairs. Bynes, who at 13 years old was the star of her namesake show and now is retired from acting. Now I have to say I'm kind of happy that Kylie and Travis chose to change up their baby's name. It was creative, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> I know, I was not a fan of Wolf. All right, now we're going to take one final look at weather. Oliver, what do you have for us? Well, like I said, those storms will be dwindling down around the beginning of the weekend. And then after that, we are going to be seeing a pretty clear week ahead of us with temperatures getting into the mid 50s. Well, I'm definitely excited for the clear part of the week towards the end. 
That's all tonight for Newslink Indiana. Be sure to join us again tomorrow night at 9, streaming live on the Newslink Indiana Facebook page. And for news anytime, anywhere, go to BallStateDaily.com. Have a great night.